Hi, my name is Brett C. Banfi, and this is another episode of Bitcoin Builders. Today, I'm very excited. Uh, as a new podcaster, you can imagine this would be the equivalent of if I was doing a soccer podcast and I had Cristiano Ronaldo on my show. Uh, I want to introduce two very special guests today. This is uh, Joshua Hensley, who has an excellent YouTube channel on all things Bitcoin related, BSV related. Also, The Morn and Run uh, and Windbell, which is a bookmarking service. As well, I want to introduce Lucas Lorenzo Roanaz <laughs> from Tonic Pal, BitChat, and BitChat Nitro. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the show with me. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, same. My pleasure. So, uh, yeah, I'll start off by just giving a brief overview of what Bitcoin Builders is looking to do. Um, we're looking to showcase some of the tools and the libraries within the BSV ecosystem. Um, Bitcoin SV is the original Bitcoin protocol. Uh, you know, what, a, what it enables is development of tools that, uh, that provide new opportunities for entrepreneurs and builders and developers to grow business ideas and apps within the ecosystem. Um, so today we're going to be showcasing some of those tools. Uh, and um, I have Josh on as someone who really focuses on this on his own channel and uh, makes excellent content, um, everything from how to build a transaction to how to he write Hello World. I highly recommend that you check his uh, content out. Um, and uh, Luke, who will be demonstrating some of the uh, tools that, uh, that he is responsible for. Um, yeah, so... Luke, do you want to give us a little intro into, um, you know, what you'll be showcasing first for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to start kind of zoomed out and then we'll, we'll get to a specific use case here, but I want to kind of paint the broad picture here. The idea that started all of this is that here we have Bitcoin and it's really interesting that you can add data to transactions. So what can we do with this data? Well, we have protocols that are data protocols that are just by protocol just means a very specific way to write the data in a transaction that's like you publish that and you say hey this is how we you know write this data and this is what this means and uh you know one of the first ones is b protocol from unwriter which is basically a simple way to format data so that you're describing an actual file so you can put a jpeg or a or a markdown file or, you know, any type of file that, that you might have, you could store it on the blockchain. So with that nice little starting point, uh, we wanted to add more capabilities such as like tagging transactions with metadata. So that's where magic attribute protocol comes in. And that is very, very simple. It's literally just tagging like keys and keys and values on a transaction. So an example of a key value pair that's very common with Magic Attribute Protocol is the key of app and the value is, um, you know, whatever your app name is. And then you'll have another key called type, which describes the type of action or the type of uh, uh, transaction, like what this transaction is representing in this kind of data uh, realm. So from those building blocks, we start to think about, okay, what can we do with this? Well, we have Bitcoin all of a sudden gives us this opportunity. This is what where my focus is anyway. I don't want to speak for everybody out there, but um, you have the ability to almost use Bitcoin as a neutral backend. Whereas you always had private databases like a Facebook database has, you know, all these billions of users and they basically control and own that data set. And you can participate in it or you can leave and they still basically have your data and all that kind of thing. Sure, there's regulation around it and all this. But the point is, they're the ultimate um, custodian and authority of all that stuff. And what we're talking about trying to do is change that model around so that people are in control of their own stuff. And with Bitcoin and using Bitcoin as the shared interoperable backend by simply tagging transactions in specific ways and then letting other people... Uh, read them elsewhere or, or write them to the chain uh, from other sources as well. And both apps can kind of read and write to the blockchain. Uh, and theoretically, there could be hundreds of these 
apps that are all using the same uh, the same tags on the transaction uh, to represent like, hey, this is a, a message in a chat is, you know, some of the things that we've been messing with. This is a social media post. This is a like or a reaction emoji to somebody else's message. Um, all of these components that we associate with like social media, we're breaking those different actions down, kind of listing those things out, putting those up on bitcoinschema.org where they're, they're documented. Hey, anybody wants to participate in this, this kind of open network that uses Bitcoin, you just format transactions in these specific ways, use these, uh, these keys to describe the transactions and they'll automatically get picked up by all these other uh, apps that are out there. So that's kind of the big idea in, in a nutshell. There's a lot to go into in terms of how to achieve, uh, you know, how to deal with signatures, how to do the identity stuff, how to, uh, what, you know, what kind of impacts this, this has uh, on social media and, and things like this. But it's also important to realize this is the context that we're talking about this in and the things that we built, like the first apps that we built with this stuff is really focused around social media and communication and, and this kind of thing. But it's just important to also realize this is a very broad, this could be very broad. Bitcoinschema.org could describe all kinds of different stuff. And this could apply to all sorts of different apps and industries. And, um, but you, you know, like let, logistics between companies when they're shipping something across the world or something like that and they need to coordinate even though it's many companies and many legs involved well this is the kind of thing that lets you do that really easily or picture a big map where uh, people are tagging geolocations onto transactions and the transaction might have an attachment of some file it could be a 3d object it could be a picture it could be music whatever and you're tagging that on a map and then you have an app that's a map that you can see all this stuff but again, nobody owns that data set. That data set is public and it's just coming from Bitcoin. And that's that's the gist of what all this is about. Awesome. And uh, Josh, I know that you really get your hands dirty when it comes to anything that is at the forefront of this technology. Um, you really like to be one of the first people that breaks it down uh, because of your background um, that uh, it's where you can actually play with it and see what it can do. But it seems like you're uh, really especially kind of gung-ho about this. Um, do you want to maybe share some of your uh, interest in this? Yeah, so I would say next to the payment solution that Bitcoin natively offers, this was probably the second most thing I was excited about, which I think has probably attracted almost all the developers across all coins to blockchain in general, which is this idea of interacting with a quote unquote decentralized database, right? The idea of doing a transaction and that other people can ingest it, interpret it however they want. Uh, I think ubiquitously, this is being used for say DeFi pools where people do swaps and you know, you have people engaging with an exchange that is on chain, but no one really controls it, so to speak. It's just the skin that interprets the, um, that lets you interact and they take fees, but you could have multiple skins across the same DeFi pools, right? This exists on other chains. What Luke is more talking about is doing with data, which is really only possible with BSV because of the lift of arbitrary limits. These other chains have too many limits or too high fees to be able to pull this type of stuff like emoji reactions or text, right? Uh, technically it's possible in some of them, but again, you know, once you pass character limits, then it's, it's not really feasible. You definitely can't do music or files or that sort of stuff. So that explains the choice of BSV. Um, but yeah, Luke touched on it, logistics. I think we're a long ways away from this actually happening. But when I, I got into the space when I was working, and that was one of the use cases that fascinated me, is because there's so much time spent in integration work between companies to communicate orders, especially if it's many to many that if they could do it securely encrypted on a blockchain, that makes so much more sense because you would reduce a lot of friction in that trade and interpreting the data, especially if the protocol that they're leveraging, like what Luke is describing, if it's MAP or what Bitcom, whatever, if it's that's known between the company. So it, it just take a lot of risk and issues away. You could still have problems, but at least both sides would kind of be able to look, have a hash, a unique ID, instead of having an internal ID in their database 
an internal ID in their other day in the company B's database, and then coming together and say, what the hell actually happened here? This, what Luke is talking about gets rid of a lot of those issues. It does bring up other issues like he alluded to, GDPR, whatever. I think those are all solvable problems, especially with the benefits that are uh, that come with it. Yeah, and so to me, it sounds like one of the key benefits here is actually just saving money. It sounds like uh, it's really what you're saying and what I'm hearing is that it's really expensive to be, you know, storing and housing all of this data yourselves. Obviously, if you're a large enough company, you need an entire infrastructure team that you need to manage and you need to, you know, I always used to joke around that why does the Radio Shack need to have my my phone number. Every every single different Radio Shack has my phone number, you know, and then the Home Depot has my phone number and they're all storing all of this data, you know, and they all have to have an infrastructure team that maintains and keeps that data. And so it's actually of a, an economic benefit if we if we can just use a single back end that ties the identity to the data. Now, this can be obviously very open ended. It doesn't have to just be phone numbers, et cetera. But um, the problem with that is that it is, you know, you, you have to pay for this, right? They're not people aren't just going to uh, provide you this data for free. Um, but prior to the ability for Bitcoin to come around, you know, you couldn't fly low enough to the ground where you could actually pay for the service. Um, but still have it be economically feasible to beat, uh, you know, the centralized data houses at at their own game. And um, and so to me, it sounds like that's that's the uh, the the um, you know, what what the value proposition is, is you can actually break these payments down and pay for exactly what you need. And then the flip side of that as well is the specialization of um of data where some some organ or some um, entities may be better at analyzing the frequencies of a music file and and some may be better at ensuring that you know that data fits a certain you know byte character limit etc uh and we can by by using this single back end and orienting everyone all, all the different entities towards that because i like to use the example of a courtyard you know imagine you live in a courtyard and you have a window that shows you know the courtyard but your neighbor across the way he has a window to the courtyard as well everyone can publicly see you know the courtyard in this case is kind of like the database we can all see the database but we're looking at it from different angles and it's our ability to kind of uh to kind of um you know simultaneously be be interpreting this information that allows for this specialization and this uh this um introduction of new opportunities that don't exist otherwise so i'm going to ask you one uh um, one more question here before we get started. Um, you mentioned, uh, and and this is kind of a question to both of you because I I think both of you have been in the space long enough that uh, you'll each have an interesting um, answer to this. But you mentioned, uh, you know, building the concept of the mag magic attribute protocol off of uh, some things that uh, Unwriter was working on. And can you talk a little bit about Unwriter? Maybe there might be some people that that aren't familiar with Unwriter. Um, you know. Uh, what what did Unwriter uh, do for this space in general, or for these ideas in general? Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> I think at the time that these ideas were coming out, it was a really fun and interesting time in Bitcoin. It was when the first uh, when the op return limit uh, was first raised. I think to what like what was it a hundred kilobytes or something like that, um, and it kind of created this like explosion of creativity as people started to explore, well, what else can we do with data on the blockchain since we couldn't do it before? What can we now do with our new toys? And uh, he, there's a lot of different things that Unwriter was creating. He, he created a lot of prototypes for concepts and was responsible for stoking a lot of the ideas that were floating around in that time. And uh, it wasn't, just him, there were a bunch of people, a bunch of developers that were in the Atlantis Slack at the time that were all sharing these similar ideas. It's just that when these ideas would come up, Unwriter would go and quickly implement something that was a great MVP of that concept. And he would do that, uh, you know, in such a way that made him pretty like prolific. Like he, he, he was uh, extremely productive and the amount of different tools and things that he released in that time period is like ridiculous. Uh, there was one period of time where he released a new, and it was a Bitcoin data indexing tools were part of his specialty. This idea of a planaria, as he called them, were 
where he had a full node set up and he had a box sitting next to that that was indexing all of that data and letting you query it in certain ways. So that is at the heart of all of this. You need to be able to query the data to show some social media network that's on Bitcoin or some whatever. You need to filter just this smaller data set. You don't want to try to deal with this whole giant blockchain. It's way too much and things would be way too slow. Uh, and so the idea is you take the blockchain, you filter that down into smaller um, chunks uh, in, in the form of servers or services or APIs that you then can query and do things with. So for the uh, stuff that we're doing, a lot of it, like what, what I'm using for BitChat, uh, Nitro.com, as well as the BitChat Classic, they both use the, it's called the BMAP API. BMAP refers to B protocol and MAP, magic attribute protocol. Just saying um, that we're using BMAP is just a generic term to say anything that's using a MAP protocol will get indexed by that. And then the term BMAP is the parser that parses the transaction. It's just a, a name that was given to it because I can't name every protocol that it supports. But by naming two, it kind of indicates that it supports more than one. Uh, so it's a it's a parser, it's a piece of software, it's a parser that you run a raw transaction through it and it processes it, it detects what kind of uh, transaction uh, data might be in there, what protocols are used and tries to make it easy for you to work with that stuff. And then there's an API that basically lets you query that processed data. So you're not like trying to query some raw hex from a transaction or something like that or something else very hard. Um, it indexes these like, like, for example, if it's a message, we're indexing um, map, you know, app is bitchatnitro.com, type is message, and then the B content is uh, an actual markdown uh, file, which is, means it can support formatting and all this other kind of stuff. Um, the processor will see that transaction. It will say, hey, I see that there's some B content here and there's some map content here. So then it makes it so that you can query on the API and be like, hey, give me all uh, map.app is bitchat nitro. And then boom, you'll get all of the bitchat stuff. Or you could say, give me just messages that are in this specific channel, for example. Um, and that, that way you start filtering on these tags that are put into the transactions. And then you can render a whole website and you know build with it like you would a normal database. Um, so yeah, Unwriter was definitely like, uh, the starting point for a lot of for what's at the core of all this, which is indexing the blockchain and providing the ability to query that. Uh, and that's something that's needed if you are uh, trying to use the, the blockchain as a back end. And just a quick note there, the name Unwriter kind of suggests exactly this. Like he focused on Bitcoin reading software, not necessarily writing. He did write a couple of tools that were for broadcasting and creating transactions with that his focus was on indexing and reading the blockchain. And uh, Josh, um, so if what Luke is describing is kind of like the Lego blocks, uh, what does that for you enable you as a developer to do? I know that um, you were talking about different skins that uh, reference the same data and you've sort of had a, a lot of experience with sort of developing things along that line with uh, with retro twitch and retro feed and things like that. Um, so that obviously gets your creative uh, idea uh, ideas mm -hmm. flowing. And, and how how do you see that going forward in terms of what you can use to develop with those tools? Yeah. So what Luke just described, the sort of APIs and indexers he's talking about that Unwriter pioneered has gotten us where we're at today, which is the ability to take the base raw transaction of the Bitcoin protocol and interpret it however we want. So for example, um, I'm using a similar service, which is the Jungle Bus tool that I think believe powers the BMAP API. I'm mm -hmm. using that on my retro feed site to do exactly what Luke was just talking about. Interpret only certain ones, right? So I pick and choose. So for obviously all the stuff that goes through my domain is goes into my database. But I have a backend process that's reading the chain through Jungle Bus and I interpret those different map fields say app name only for retrofeed. But if it's from another app that say, maybe I want to whitelist or just, I don't care, I'll give me the global of all the chats, which is basically what I'm doing. And I'll put those in the database and I'll index it with the channel name like Luke talked about. So you have a generic channel that doesn't 
have one, no field set, right? So that's just the global chat. But then you have a test channel that me and him were using right before this meeting started. You can make as many channels as you want. So think of these as say subreddits, right? Where, you know, game, sports, specific sports teams, I mean, it's endless, right? And that's due to the, just the nature of that, but also as well as the scalability. So as we've talked about, instead of no central database, now we're able to basically have these forums on chain that people can choose what to store. So instead of Reddit having everything, you might have a company that only for, focuses on say old school games or like my client does is themed old school gaming, right? So I could just filter out content based off whatever, app name, topics, tags. I mean, you just think about it. The app becomes kind of the arbiter of what they want to show and interact versus a private company or a publicly traded one with their single database basically having full control over the users and the data, and they can do all kinds of nefariousness as we've seen over the last few years. Okay. And yeah, then I think it's worth mentioning here this really cool balance that gets struck here. So Josh kind of alluded to this, but you have users in control of their own data. They can sign messages and prove that they are them. It's basically the Twitter blue check mark, which is what we have with, uh, with uh, Bitcoin attestation protocol, which is yet another one that we use in this whole scheme. That gives us a, like a lot of capability, but there's this there's this fine line uh, between uh, being uh, like when people hear DEX, they immediately think you're doing something illegal. But the point is the user interface chooses what it surfaces. So whatever is required for it to be compliant, it can still be compliant and it can put things onto this this DEX and then read things out of them. But it, it could choose not to list certain things or not like Josh said it could choose to just operate on a whitelist basis and say, I'm only going to show, yeah, I'm operating on a DEX, but I'm only going to show tr uh, orders and transactions on my site from these 10 trusted operators or uh, other clients that I know are creating transactions. And I know that they're coming from them because they're signing them uh, when they get created so that they can, they can prove that. So we have this nice, um, ability to create those trusted relationships and to whitelist things and whatever, but we also have the ability to just leave things wide open and uh, listen to the whole universe or somebody is actually free to implement their own client if they're not satisfied with the rule sets that are being followed out there by the various uh, products that you know are on the market for them. That's awesome. Uh, and then uh, maybe we can jump in and take a look at the tools and how that's actually accomplished. And uh, but before we do that, just uh, Josh, I wanted to ask you one more question, which is, um, you know, what is the importance? It sounds like uh, having a protocol that's sort of set in stone where where um, where the underlying uh, base layer isn't maneuvering around is, is vital to to all of this. Uh, can you comment on that maybe? Yeah, so that's um for me, that made it a very easy choice back in 2018, of which fork, whatever you want to call it, between BCH and BSV to choose. Because if you start changing that base raw transaction, then you create technical debt for every single developer that is building on top of that raw transaction. So for example, Luke is ingesting all these raw transactions from directly from the Bitcoin ledger, right? If you, if you say, okay, well, six months have passed, which... That means we, for some reason, we have to change the software just because you start tinkering with that hex. When it goes, when the, the new version comes into Luke's thing, Luke's indexer, and his code worked before that six month timeline, right? It worked in that chunk, that six months before, but then they made a change where they, it does something new now in his indexer. It could be all kinds of bugs, right? Maybe it's a very simple change. Maybe it's very complex. It doesn't really matter but it could, it's a change. It could cause it to crash, right? And suddenly, just because the developers made some change that the nodes upgraded to, Luke's service just got wrecked for no reason. Nothing of his fault because the protocol changed. So now Luke has to stop whatever he was doing, innovating, whatever, polishing, bug fixing, that's relevant to the app. He has to stop. He has to go back and say, okay, now I gotta fix this bug. Maybe it takes him 10 minutes, maybe it takes him 10 weeks. Who knows, right? That is why you need a fixed protocol because, and that's what all these people on these other chains don't understand. And, you know, I'm going to say something a little controversial. A lot of them haven't really had real jobs like the rest of us, meaning you haven't worked in corporations where you actually have to deliver product 
on timeline, have deadlines, set expectations, all this sort of stuff. You're just tinkering with stuff. Oh, this is cool, so I'm just going to do it. That stuff, you know, we that's fine, but you tinker with stuff like what Luke and, and yourself and I are talking about, which is application layer, not the protocol layer. Yeah. Yeah, to me, it's like, imagine if you were an arcade operator and uh, and you're building these machines that are, you know, playing, <laughs> playing, uh, letting letting kids come in and play their quarters but then you know the federal reserve every six months is changing the size of a quarter you know so like you know yeah, you, yeah. You, 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 how are you gonna how are you gonna actually yeah. build an That's arcade when you have to re re-engineer yeah. what the quarter actually is yeah um you, all right little, little, little jimmy comes in the arcade and you're like sorry jimmy your quarter's too small too big yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly you gotta go home <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or or now we have to we have to build new cast iron, you know, molds to, you know, to to uh to receive this new quarter by the time you're done, you know, engineering and building all of that, the quarter's already changed its size again, you know. So um but but uh Luke, could you maybe um walk us through how like, you know, I know the developers that are watching this, they're going to be of the Lego mind, they want to play with the tools and how would they do that? Cool. Yeah, let's uh, let's bring up the screen share here. All right, cool. So this is the Jungle Bus service. So I'm going to kind of go through and showcase kind of how the BMAP API is put together just at a high level and kind of walk through some of that. And then we'll get to the actual application and show you how it, it looks to use it. So Great. this is this is Jungle Bus. I'm already signed in here. So on the dashboard, um, you can see there's all of these. Why did that show any data? There we go. Um, you can see these these various subscriptions. So this one here called Map. This is the filter that I'm using to get all of the Magic Attribute Protocol data. And all I have to do is say in the output types here, I want Map data. There's a handful of different types of data here supported. This is Author Identity Protocol, Bitcoin Attestation Protocol, Run, uh, Stas Tokens, Bitcom, and PubKey Hash. Um, there might be some more listed in the docs, but the point is this will grow. There'll be more things supported soon. But for now, uh, I'm, I'm using this. You can actually uh, go right here and hit test on this. And you can see you start a subscription and boom, Jungle Bus is going to feed you from whatever block height you pick uh, transactions that match um, your query. So for me, you can see there's 65 in this block height, there were 65 map transactions in this block, there were 72 and so on and so forth. And it actually, it's not showing them all here, but when you connect in code to jungle bus, it feeds you the full transaction. Uh, so you get, you, you get everything and you're able to basically collect only the relevant transactions for whatever your purpose is and then put them in your own database that is more flexible. So you probably want to process that because Jungle Bus is going to give you back a raw like transaction hex. And you're going to want to process that into something more manageable. Like that's where we use the BMAP uh, uh, JavaScript library to process that. And then we store that in a Mongo database uh, in the case of the BMAP API. But this part is interchangeable. You build your own however you need to build it. And Jungle Bus is kind of the raw connection to the miner in order to get the Bitcoin data. Yeah, so this is your, your the goal here is to do a first pass that whittles down that data set to something way more manageable. I want to touch so on something if, you just said that he's, he mentioned that he's going to use a certain library that he built to interpret the transactions how he wants using a database that he wants. You contrast that to what we've been saying where you have a company. Well, if you're a developer at that company, you have to use whatever they say, which was probably decided back in like 1992, right? Whereas as a developer, you can just choose. I don't, you know, for example, let's say I don't like MongoDB, right? I like MySQL. So that's what I use on my backend. And I, I don't use BMAP library. I built my own because I just felt like it. Some developers want that, some don't. Some will just say, oh, well, I like what Luke did, so I'll do that. Or I'll choose the BMAP parser, but I'll choose SQLite, right? right. Or, um, you know, one of these other new databases that keep coming out. So it, and allows it, becomes the developer, a place for ideas. it allows the developer to choose their own preferences of how they interpret this stuff. But again, because we have a fixed protocol, they do whatever they want and they're not bound to a certain tech stack. So now that we got the subscription in here, I'll show you what it looks like to actually connect to it in code here. 
So here's the BMAP API. You can see here's my subscription. And then here's the, um, I've imported this, the Jungle Bus client. This is the, the name of the NPM package that you'd have to install. So you would do like yarn install, gorilla pool, JS Jungle Bus. And then once you have that, you use, and th this example code is on the website. I'm just showing you how I actually have it implemented. Sure. Um, when uh, on publish here means that uh, I've got a new um, actual transaction data that's that's uh, been found in one of these uh, blocks. Uh, when there's a new block that's found, you get a notice there. You can get a notice. Uh, okay, so actually th this one's waiting on new block. New block is found. What the point is you have these callbacks. So this is on status, all the different statuses. You, you can do things on error. You know, you, you catch your error, but the, the important ones are on publish and on mempool. And in both of those, I call this process tr transaction function. And then in there, you can see I'm I'm uh, parsing this a little bit, uh, converting it into into Bob and, and setting some of these other extra values on it and things like that before I save it in my database. Um, but that's the point is you're getting callbacks from the client, you're gonna process it in some way, and then you're gonna save it into your database. The, which database and how you process it, like Josh said, totally up to you. So once you're, you're there and you have this, this database populated. In my case, I've also got this little query tool that comes from Unwriters Planaria stuff. I've got the ability to show you what the database looks like and to do some queries live right here so you can see what got indexed and what the data kind of looks like when you break it down. So here's a query I did for all of everything with app of bitchatnitro.com. And you can see there's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of things in here. You can see, you know, that this is a message. It was in this channel called zillions of messages and it was by Mungo Jelly. And the content was, looks like he just literally wrote the characters S and H and R eight F. So he's trying to put a bunch of transactions on chain today, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but the point here is that you, um, even though tonic Powell, for example, is not using a lot of this social stuff, we still tag our transactions there with map.app as well. So I think if you search for tonic pow, you can see tonic pow stuff. If you search for twitch, you're going to see twitch stuff. And this is just because I'm indexing everything that uses magic attribute protocol. If it does, I'm parsing it and then putting it in with these nice human readable field names. Like, um, you see, this is map dot, you know, uh, app is twitch map.invoice they have on here with some invoice id uh they've got some map.url is this this url which is it looks like this is a post to on a twitter post like it references a a, a twitter post but anyway that's the point is otherwise you're dealing with just like raw hacks and things like this this is a processed easier to use easier to query situation so now i can do things like map.type equals message to see not just messages from BitChat Nitro, but I would see things from BitChat Classic like here. And if I scroll through, I'll probably see some from other clients as well. Like, uh, well, I, I didn't get one in this query, but um, if I change this to uh, app and to retrofeed.me, I can see the stuff from Josh's site too. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of how the backend is getting populated from Jungle Bus. You get this feed of data, you process it, save it in the database so it can be queried in a nice, easy way. And now you can build an app and uh, let's, let's check this out. So this is BitChat Nitro. And here is uh, the, the network panel, we can watch some of the actual, uh, queries that are being made to the backend. So we can understand how this is working, but in the test channel here, I'll just say, Hey, and that's going to post and cool that posted. And, and you can see it's, it's right there, but now let's, uh, let's reload this page and see the, the queries that are being used to populate this sure. list. So here are all these queries that, oh, what's up? 
it pinged on my side. So I got it too. So yeah, when he sent that message, it popped on my client. I know folks can't see it, but there was a little video game noise that played, which showed his message. But the cool part is that we're just using the same tool set. There's no cross API calls from my domain to his or anything like that. It's just, right. it just worked. He's yeah, exactly. Wow. Bitcoin is the universal source of truth and everything. If all the data flows down from Bitcoin to everything else. So we write to Bitcoin and Bitcoin is used to propagate the indexers that attach to Bitcoin are used to propagate that further. Um, so check, check this out. This is, this is kind of cool. And I think it explains a lot. So here's this query that gets made to, to load the messages. So let's open this up in a new tab and you can see all this data is there with messages for this test channel. I'll change this queue up here to query so we can actually see that friendly query interface. And we can see what's being queried here is map.type of message and map.channel of test. So this will give us results just for the test channel. And then you can go ahead and populate that data here in, in this view. So this is how, how, how the whole thing's working. Um, now, obviously you, you want to see, oh, okay, well, what are the different channels that are available? Like this whole channel list, how did I get that? Well, here's the, here's a channels query. We can see what that query looks like. This is looking for, <laughs> uh, looks like it's got some regex to exclude some underscore ENC because somebody was putting some encrypted channels in public space and I just filtered them out this way. Um, but it's also, let's see, it's grouping these by channel name and then look at these results. You can see the names of all the different channels, who was the first person to post in that channel and how many messages each channel has, what the last message was and what time the last message happened. So with this query, it's super flexible and you can get all kinds of different data results that you need in order to render your front end. So from this one API, um, you're able to, to uh, query in all these different ways. Um, so in a, in a typical REST API, you'd have a bunch of different endpoints that are for like a get messages or get channels, and they'd be all separate. Uh, this is a different style where uh, you just pass, here's the API endpoint right here, b.map.sv slash q slash this huge base64 string. And that string is actually this whole query here um, that is, uh, you know, in, in base64. And then wow. you just send to the same endpoint and that lets you send any variety of query that you can imagine to one endpoint. So I use that same endpoint for all of these different requests to get the channels, the messages, the users, all of this different kind of thing that I need to fill out this interface. Um, so let's uh, try to show real quick um, something. Let's see. Bitch. Or here we go. So here's a different BitChat client. Um, and then I'll also pull up Retrofeed. And Retrofeed has a chat interface a, a, as well. So if I just type, uh, I already did try to type GM in here today. I can't be that uncreative. <laughs> I'll say, GM again. Yeah. It seems to me like this is the, a much more economical way to send and receive information uh on the one hand you are you are uh indexing all the information that's relevant to you so maybe that takes a little bit of extra time because you might end up indexing things that maybe you don't actually end up ever needing um i don't know why that would be the case but i can imagine you know like if you're indexing everything that's been given a certain attribute and maybe a certain uh someone you know all the way across the world is doing the same thing and maybe you're both using the same um, attributes, but you don't need each other's data. So on the one hand, you are sort of using a wide net to catch a lot of information. But on the other hand, when you're making these calls, uh, you aren't having to call for every specific piece of information. Uh, is that, does that make sense? Because you have a more of a global view of the entire, uh, the entire data set. Well, it, de it depends on where we're talking about. So if we're talking about on the jungle bus side of things, that is a much broader view. And like, even if I'm doing all map stuff, like from the perspective of bit chat, right? Map, ha the BMAP API has more data than is needed. 
because it has um, Twitch data, which doesn't show in BitChat. It has Tonic Pow data, which doesn't show in BitChat. Ideally, if BitChat was to be this particular interface for BitChat was to become more mature, it could create its own API that only has just what it has, and it would be even more, you could squeeze more efficiency even out of it than what we're currently using. But it's also nice to have one kind of generic API that you can use for many different sites. And it only really becomes an issue if things scalability wise get out of hand and you need to continue to kind of shard things out. Um, but, but the point is you can always do that. And if you look at the big networks that we have out there now, like Twitter, I mean, what do they do? Like 500 million messages a day or something like that. This is done with traditional infrastructure, right? They're, they're one service. They have data, huge, you know, databases and they have socket connections to all these people on their API that can send fire hose of filtered data right to them and process all of this stuff in, in one location. So the, so the point is, um, none of these individual clients anytime soon are going to be the size of Twitter and, uh, you know, we'll be able to manage just fine filtering this stuff and, and, and displaying it. Yeah. Now, now I'm in the test channel here. Let me just type test in here and we should, here we go. Popped up here. Perfect. So the, the, the reason I'm, I'm showing this is that this thing is posting to the blockchain. Jungle bus is feeding the, the, uh, BMAP API. And then this thing is, is connected with this socket connection to the BMAP API. So it gets a real time notice anytime that something was posted to the blockchain. So that's what you just saw for a full circle was from one app being posted, the other real time being notified uh, that something changed. So and pretty, pretty cool. Point, yeah, I think a point that's related to what you were just saying, Brett, is that these apps make the decision on what they store and show um, versus not. Right. So let's say if Luke was cussing, for example, and I, I wanted a family friendly site, I could just just because he did it doesn't mean I have to accept it. However, there's a nuance there with censorship versus uh, not. That's not censorship because no one can dispute the fact that he cussed on chain. Right. right. Like, there's a hash. And you can go see it elsewhere. It, yeah. yeah. Right. It happened. Maybe someone does want, oh, I want all the cuss words or I want only cuss words. And or that's it could be a setting. User settings can start, hmm. you know, being the way that people filter a lot of this stuff. And, and that's actually a great way to do this. If you have, especially if you add filters and then you allow other people to subscribe to your filters, that's a whole nother approach. Um, right. You know, for a so, lot of this stuff, especially because there will be a point where people try to abuse this and put certain material to kind of test the limits and whatever else. There's a lot of interesting ways for, uh, public, you know, well, like we do with uh, spam email, you know, there's a public block list that curators maintain and you can subscribe exactly. to them and email client that filters out spam. Yeah. And I have so it's, it, it's different than what we have today with say Facebook and Twitter and all these other platforms where if you do something that they don't like, they'll just arbitrarily censor what you said or ban you outright. The same thing can happen with these platforms, but the difference is it happened. No matter what anyone says, when someone tweets something, whether it's controversial or posts something on Facebook, that occurs in life. But what these guys are doing, which is very nefarious in my opinion, is they're basically throwing it out so that they look crazy if they say, hey, this happened. And that's the difference that we have here. These things are occurring on a public ledger. But it also solves the problem, this, this approach we're talking about, of this whole narrative of putting illicit content on the blockchain. Well, who's serving it? right? The app makes the decision. The domain makes the decision. They're liable if they serve it. But if they have the controls in place, it does. you can put as much illegal stuff on the chain as you want. We're just not going to show it, store it at all. So we're not culpable. And that's the difference here is, you know, this is how we deal with some of these tired, frankly, things that have been brought up, which is, it's really just approaching the problem in a new way. So again, you know, as someone that's the, the more of the novice and uh, this is a lot of new information to me, but I find it so fascinating. You know, my question is, uh, can you comment on whether or not, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like this is almost a, a replacement of a push 
data uh, operation and it is more of a poll data operation, is that uh, is that valid to kind of make that analogy there? Um, I mean, you are pushing from the API down to the, the clients. You know, the, the notification is definitely a push style notification on that side. Um, but <laughs> when you load the page initially, that's a poll, right? Because you're, you're querying the API and you're, you're pulling the data out of, out of the API where, um, yeah. So I, I would say it's kind of, it, it depends <laughs> on the situation. Well, I guess, I guess my, my point is, uh, you know, imagine that I, uh, you know, um, Josh has his old school gaming uh, platform. So let's just use that as the example. Um, maybe, you know, there are a few uh, services that specialize in old school gaming content. So instead of Josh having to ha send in, you know, send a query to like, maybe let's say there's three, you know, send a query. Is there any new old school gaming information that you've uh, made today so that I can know to populate it? You know, instead, uh, he just um, uses the, the um, protocol to essentially allow that data to be sorted for himself. And then he pulls that data into his feed. Does that make sense? Is that kind of how it's happening? Yeah. I mean, yeah, because yeah. I'm, not, I'm not asking any server, for example, except mine for the data. But in the background, it's just work. It's just gathering it from the blockchain. Right. So when someone comes to the site, sure, their client makes a query to my database, but it doesn't make it to some external place to pull. It already just gets what's been passively accruing there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, to me, I just think that that is much more e efficient and, um, mm. and it, it, um, it's, it's more reflective of what's going on. You know, one of the problems that I think we all could, I, you know, identify is this concept of, you know, uh, Daniel Krawitz uses that, uh, the concept of the hub and spoke model where, you know, you have to connect back to the hub in order to see what's going on with all the spokes. Um, but it sounds like, you know, like the problem with that is like you were saying before, Josh, is that the if the hub has a certain opinion about what is a valid spoke and what's not, you know, then uh, then that data doesn't get passed to you um, because it gets filtered through the hub and then routed to you. Um, right. And so, yeah, so this seems like, you know, just a novel way of transmitting information in a way that enables and and. Um, you know, maintains the agency of each actor that is participating in that information, uh, you know, uh, passageway, whether it's, you know, sending or receiving information, um, you know, it's, it's not my inability or my, uh, my um, desire to exclude certain information doesn't you know, doesn't impede your desire to access that same information. Right. Yeah. Did we want, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's a good way to, to, to think about it. Um, I, I did want to mention real quick, there are some trade-offs at play with some of this stuff. Like a lot of these things are not, it's not just all sunshine and rainbows. There's, there's certain tight times when you want to use this kind of thing. And there's certain times where you really just want to send, a raw transaction directly to another party um, and you don't need just like similarly, there's times when you want to use a blockchain and there's times when there's no reason to even use one. Right. Um, when you need to coordinate with multiple parties uh, and without necessarily needing to know who each party is and reach out to them individually, if that would be a cumbersome or whatever, then this is a good candidate for something like that where you have, um, you know, also anything where there's like public records, this is great kind of set up for public record type stuff to store on chain that people can then access, um, you know, later. And there's also this interesting hybrid, which I'm showing on the screen now is um, DM interface. I think Josh would have to accept my, uh, my friend request here so that we could show this working, but we also have DMs built into this, which is a really interesting concept um, because DMs are are private, and that's a sensitive thing. And and these are these are some this kind of weird DMs, right? They're they're um, the fact that they're happening is public, 
because this is all really, all of this lends itself to public activity, you know, to stuff that you're putting out there and saying, hey, I said this at this time or whatever, that's at the core of this. But you can do that and then send an encrypted message to another person. So the content of the message is encrypted between the people, but there's some visibility on chain, not necessarily in the interface at all, but there's, you know, you'd be able to see on, on chain that people were, were communicating, but you would never be able to read the messages. Um, but you can imagine this is super useful because there's no other way than this. If you want to actually have cross platform encrypted messaging. Um, and there's some ways that we can improve this to make it a little bit more private where that part that I'm talking about, maybe with the, uh, once IPv6 gets kind of fully worked into all of these ideas, I think you'd be able to send raw messages directly off chain, you know, to directly to the person by IP address. Um, once the initial handshake is done and then you wouldn't be able to, you might see that a channel was created between these two parties, but you now won't have timestamped messages of when exactly they communicated and in which direction. Um, so that, that, that it, it is something that can be improved, but this is a really interesting start of a new kind of a DM system that doesn't exist as far as I know outside of this. Then this means that we can actually DM cross platform. So Retrofeed can have users. Well, where are those users? They're not from his, some user database that's owned somewhere. They are from people who did signatures and put things on chain. Now you can tell this is a user that's out there. And now I can go to that user. I can hit the friend request button like I've done here with Josh. And that basically create, creates a new key based on my identity that I use just for communicating with Josh. That way, if the keys ever compromise, it only compromises the one conversation and not anything else having to do with my identity or other conversations or other uh, keys. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want to try to, to, to do this, but I, I mean, there's really not much to show. If he accepts the, the request here, what, what we're going to see is that, uh, you know, we can message back and forth. It's not, it's, it's kind of uneventful. I can demo it here e easily with myself. So this is encrypted messages uh, to, to my own self. So you can see I can kind of write the word test here and then it, it shows up. But if I was to go look at this message on chain and look at the parsed transaction, you can see that this is a message. It was sent to this BAP ID, um, which is mine. And then you can see the content of the message here is completely encrypted. Um, so that, that word test doesn't appear here or whatever. This is a binary encrypted uh, uh, payload there. And it's just being decrypted in the front end in, in my client here. Wow. So. We have a, uh, a few more minutes left. So I wanted to just um, uh, maybe end our conversation on something a little more high level uh, and just, um, you know, so from what I'm hearing, basically with that, if you can carry that forward, you could have something like, you know, me on my WhatsApp messaging you on your Telegram and uh, Josh, you know, on his signal. Um, and and we're but we're all able to uh, communicate together. Um, and uh, so that, that leads me to just, you know, like the topic that I'd love to end on is just um, the concept of freedom in general. Uh, you know, the, these uh, these barriers that we're crossing right now, uh, what does that mean for freedom in the broad sense? And uh, and how does that like inform and uh, and um, help you to drive towards the innovation that you're uh, delivering here? Well, I love this question because this is really what it's all about. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we've seen the consequences of allowing mega platforms to hold all of the relationships between people and then be able to have that power. We've seen that they are willing to abuse that power. They stayed relatively neutral for a certain period of time, but they've now decided that this is a viable tool that they're going to use to set to silence people, to remove people from the platform or to hide certain messages or to, or to manipulate the context. Uh, and we've also seen the harm that can be done from people uh, impersonating others and pretending that they're somebody else. And so with, you know, the Bitcoin attestation protocol that we have here with the the totally different design of this type of system, um, those those issues are really they, they become non issues without sacrificing the 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 right of the individual platform to do whatever they want on their platform that is true you can censor on your own platform if that's what you want to do 
what you couldn't do before is, you know, pack your, your ball and go home, right? Like you, you, you couldn't uh, just, you know, sign off of Twitter and sign into something else that had all of the relationships, all the people who you were following, and then just didn't do the censorship stuff that you didn't like. You didn't have that option. So this gives us on a fundamental level, the mechanisms that we need in order for applications to give those options to the users mm -hmm. and for users to be in complete control of their data for real, like the full, the full way. You have your identity, you have your keys, you're making your messages, you can encrypt things with them, you know, and at the same time, we don't treat this like individual keys or identity. Keys can be rotated. Keys can be sort of deactivated and decommissioned because we're using the Bitcoin attestation protocol for that. So yeah, I think it's a it's a final, um, it's a full demonstration end to end of how we can distribute these sorts of things using Bitcoin as the back end and interoperate between multiple apps doing it. And it's uh, it's really pretty fun. I mean, I don't think there's anything much more fun that you could be building. Uh, out there right now there's some cool like stuff that you could do with vr and gaming game development is, is cool and all this sort of stuff uh but this stuff is really really neat and it's so under um explored at the moment yeah i think the cross-platform messaging because right now you know i know i'm sure there's explanations for this but people we we have to trust that signal whatsapp telegram are just telling us the truth there's really no way for us to check because they're, they're hitting some server somewhere we don't know if what data is stored against those messages where they're relaying that data to we don't know any of that but with something like this which is a big ask for the user you do have fair confidence that when i send the message ironically on a public blockchain that's encrypted to luke it most likely it's, it's just us two because we're not going through some big uh, hub, like you were saying. We're not going yeah. somewhere that sees it and can twist it. It's it's peer to peer communication, and we could we could change it up, right? We could do the relaying where we relay the raw transactions to each other and determine what we want to put on chain together. But I mean, we have we have IDs for that, which is the transaction hash. So yeah, I think it's a big deal. Just having truly private communications. Cause I mean, there's already been this stuff. I just saw an article where Facebook has a God mode where they can take over people's accounts. Twitter, Twitter's employees have been rumored to be reading folks DMs. I mean, this kind of stuff is just, frankly, it's illegal but nothing's ever really gonna be done about it. But I think the, the flush of people to something like Signal tells you that folks are aware of this issue and want solutions. And I think this can be the start of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's almost all we have. I just wanted to close with a few final thoughts on this, which are just that, you know, one of the things that really excites me about this is this concept of, okay, well, we have uh, this base protocol that is going to remain locked in, uh, which is, you know, just the Bitcoin protocol itself. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we have this way of sort of um, you know, tagging and interpreting that data using the magic attribute protocol, different key values, et cetera. Um, and essentially, like you let in during our the start to our call, you know, sort of using this the blockchain itself as kind of a shared database. What interests me about that is now if we're actually using this uh, as a shared database, imagine uh, the innovation that can happen when multiple different brilliant people, you know, imagine if we could all collaborate on the same, you know, private uh, backend Mongo database or the same backend yeah, MySQL database. You're touching on something really big here because um, traditionally the way it works is everybody starts from scratch. You want to build your own social media site. You're basically just going to build it from the ground up. You're going to pick your database tables and field names and all this kind of stuff. You're going to build out this whole thing. And then guess what? There's not going to be anybody there. You're going to have to now convince users to come use the damn thing. In this paradigm, you just build using shared protocols. You've got a backend with thousands of users and, you know, tons and tons of messages that are instantly going to populate your website and make it feel alive from the launch and without even you manually attracting any users yourself. But if every client is doing that and they're all able to attract a few as well, the whole pie grows. And this really interesting thing happens where it's like this coopetition. These are, these are competing platforms but they're all cooperating in the sense of they all share the same network effect. And that network is what is versus Facebook versus Twitter versus these other big things. So you get to kind of band together 
in order to disrupt some of these big players. And evident in what Luke just said, we saw five different BitChat clients pop up in the way he just described in 20 days. Yeah, and then the, the, the flip side of that too is that you know, if you see something that one of those other BitChat clients is doing, but you ha didn't have that innovation previously, but you say, oh, I see what they're doing. They're, uh, they're adding this unique tag here. And then, you know, but you already have 95% of what would be required to uh, implement that on your own. So we have this ability to sort of, uh, you know, build a tsunami of creativity um, mm. that, you know, as we can see, we start off with like HTML and then, you know, we end up with all of this, you know, like, uh, you know, really unique ways of populating data. Uh, but, you know, we, we sort of grow slowly over time. Uh, but, you know, with this, since we're using 95% of the same, you know, quote unquote, like the same genetic material for that data, you know, we can actually uh, just, you know, make a slight adjustment here or there and, and really, you uh, explore creativity in a much more um in a much more focused manner i think um collaboratively yeah. well uh yeah do you have one anything with uh closing thoughts here luke um just just to, you know excited to get eyes on this and to get people paying attention to it because it is really cool i think developers um you know, who maybe are, are looking at prodding at some of this stuff. I think you'd be shocked once you kind of dug in and got your MV, your first kind of MVP working, how, how easy it is to actually build stuff this way. It's very surprising and uh, very empowering. And it, and it really does. It's just a lot of fun and feels very cool to do. Um, so yeah, definitely just want to encourage people to roll up their sleeves and check it out. Awesome. And Josh, any closing thoughts for us here? Yeah, same. I think that the more people that see this, they'll get interested and that can grow that pie, that network effect to where each individual contributes their own uniqueness. So, you know, I mentioned the five clients, they all look different because they all came from a different person, but it's the same data, same protocol. So you can have just tons of creativity and people doing these novel things. And like you said, Brett, where if developer A adds some feature that developer C thinks is cool, instead of having to get him on the phone or text message him, he can just look at it and say, oh, I'll just do that too. Right, exactly. It is cool. Spontaneous collaboration like that is very, uh, very possible. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you both so much for joining uh, today. And um, yeah, I just want to, uh, to, to, the last thing that I want to leave our audience with is just to say that, you know, one of my roles in, aside from just being passionate and trying to learn as much as I can about this stuff. One of the things I think I do really well is, uh, you know, I know that there may be people that are listening that want to get involved, want to get started. And, uh, but maybe they'll think, ah, you know, I don't want to reach out to them. They're probably very busy, you know, et cetera. And, and that's what I'm here for. Just send me a message. I'm manifestable on Twitter. I'm on uh, the BSV discord as manifestable as well. And yeah, let me know what excites you about BMAP, uh, what, ex what, how you want to get started with, uh, with, you know, implementing these API features and, you know, I'll be sure to plug you into the, to the right people. Well, Josh, uh, Luke, thank you so much for joining me and, uh, thank you everyone for, for tuning into another episode of Bitcoin Builders. <laughs>